Good afternoon. Uh, my name's Captain Phil Langley, and uh, I'm here to re represent uh, Heritage Tours for Earth Day 2020. And although this year's been a little challenging, uh, I couldn't be there in person this year, but we're certainly there in spirit. And uh, I'll certainly miss seeing all the uh, familiar faces that we normally see during Earth Day at Leonardtown. But uh, we're going to improvise here today and uh, just, just kind of uh, stay connected. So before we get uh, started too much, uh, I guess uh, kind of what I'm going to go over a little bit is I'm going to talk about uh, tools of the trade as far as on, on the water, the heritage uh, for the watermen of the bay. Uh, uh, talk to you a little bit about the crab pots, oyster tongs, snippers, these sort of things. Uh, the first thing I'm going to talk about is, uh, is a crab pot, okay? And I'm going to walk over here. This is a uh, commercial, commercial crab pot. I grabbed this one because it's not dressed out. And what I mean by it's not dressed out, these are crab pots here that are, are kind of dressed out, ready to go. Uh, a little dirty. They've been in the water. But the only differences between these right now is uh, this one, you can see, has rebarb on the bottom to help to keep the pot in place, the iron bar. And it has a line attached with a cork. So normally, if you're out on the water or going up and down the bay, the only thing you'll see is a cork floating on the water. Okay, But underneath that cork is a pot of this size. Now something else that's interesting with these, if you look at each individual cork, it will have a number engraved into the cork. And every waterman is assigned a specific number. So that's how you identify whose pots they are by the waterman's number that's engraved into the corks themselves. Uh, a crab pot, uh, way back when I used to make my own, I no longer do that. Uh, but uh, a crab pot is compromised. It has uh, four what we call funnels that crabs enter in, into the funnels in the bottom. Uh, when the pot goes overboard, it sets like so with the four funnels all the way to the uh, lowest point at the bottom. In the center here, you have a bait trap where you put bait. And majority of us, although some guys use... Uh, Razor clams, but this fish is called a whoop. It's called a menhaden, and it's a uh, a very oily fish. I wouldn't advise trying to eat one for dinner, but uh, it is uh, uh, gives off a lot of scent. And uh, most of your your predators in the Chesapeake Bay, whether they're 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 crabs or striped bass or fish or bluefish, they all really enjoy eating the the menhaden fish. The menhaden fish are also, they're, they're pretty awesome because they're filter feeders, they eat allergy, so they actually help filter the water and help clean the water as well. But what you do is you take a, a menhaden or an L.Y., you put it into the bait pot, and then you throw the pot overboard. And then the crabs smell the fish, and they crawl inside the funnels. And then this, if you look at this, it's kind of shaped almost like a church, and that's what it's called. It's called the church of the pot. And the crabs will actually migrate up. There's two holes cut into the top here, and they will migrate up. Majority of them will end up into the top of the pot. They uh, also, if you can see here, there's two coal rings, okay? And that's to let juvenile crabs escape so you don't trap everything inside the pot. So, now, what do you catch in, in crab pots? Uh, well, normally what you catch in crab pots is crabs. Now, these are your Chesapeake Bay blue crabs. Very pretty. They're kind of pronounced because of the bright blue claws. Uh, this is a male crab. You can tell the difference of the male crab, the difference between the male and the female. The male's, what we call the apron at the bottom, is shaped like the Empire State Building. I will hold up a female. It's like a barrel of monkeys when you was a kid. You know, they kind of attach to one another. But the female has 
uh, orange claws, orange tips to her claws, and her apron is kind of like the capital. It's uh, shaped very differently than the male. Okay, the interesting thing about a female crab is a female crab only mates once in her life. But with that one mating, she can lay up to a couple million eggs and she can actually, re from the one mating, she can re reproduce a couple of times. So she could actually produce up to maybe four or five million eggs. So that's uh, most things in nature that, that produce a lot of young have a very uh, small survival rate. That's why they have so many young, whether it's crabs or striped bass or fish. I've got a picture I want to show you. Uh, this, if you look at the top picture, okay, that is an immature female crab. It's called a sally. And if you look, her apron is shaped kind of like a triangle. It's not as pronounced as the mature female. And what will happen is the only time crabs can reproduce, the only time they can mate, is when the female crab is in a soft shell state. So what will happen is this immature female, as she fattens up and gets larger, then she will molt. And the male crab will sense that she's at a stage where she's getting ready to, to, to shed, come out of her shell. And he will pick her up before she sheds. And he'll swim around with her. It's what they call a doubler sometimes. I don't know whether uh, if, if, if you've lived in the area a while, if you've dipped up a crab, and sometimes you've caught a big one and a smaller one, or sometimes you might catch a, a crab with a soft crab attached. Uh, and they, they, we, we call those doublers. But when the male crab senses she's in a state right before she's ready to, to come out of her shell, he will pick her up and he will swim around with her. And they'll go to seaweed restaurants, take in underwater movies, whatever, and then eventually uh, she'll start coming out of her shell. And when she starts coming out of her shell, she will, uh, he will let go of her and crawl off a ways and kind of wait till she sheds. And then when she sheds, comes completely out of her shell, he will pick her up again. And that's the only time that the male and female can mate. Okay, once they mate, she will never ever shed. Again, she will never ever come out of her shell to grow. The male crab will continue to shed and continue to grow, but that's the last time the female crab will shed and grow. Uh, when they, the female crab, what she will do is uh, eventually, and sometimes it can take up to nine months, that she will develop an egg sac underneath her apron. The female crabs have to spawn in a high salinity area. So what you have in the fall time of the year normally is this big migration of female crabs down to the mouth of the Chesapeake Bay in higher salinity conditions. And that's where majority of your female crabs end up in the fall, is in the bay, and then they'll bury till winter, and then they, when they come out in the spring, that's when they, they, their eggs will hatch. And then the larvae swims back out into the Atlantic Ocean for a short period of time, is what they call zooey. Uh, uh, they're little microscopic, almost gnat shrimp-like creatures when the eggs first hatch. And then, through depending on the currents and the tides, they come back up into the Chesapeake Bay and start to grow and molt. Every time a crab sheds, when it comes out of its shell, it grows, it gets bigger. So they start their life cycle back into the Chesapeake Bay at that point. All right, now that we're, we're moving on to oysters a little bit, we're going to talk about oysters and the importance to the environment and to the Chesapeake Bay and the ecosystem. Uh, I've got a few samples here that I want to show you. Uh, these are some that I just tonged up here this morning, just, just to give you kind of some examples. Uh, there's a... Uh, uh, a couple of oysters, two different types that are being grown in the Chesapeake Bay now. You have a lot of aquaculture into the Chesapeake Bay, uh, and it's getting more and more popular. The majority of the aquaculture oysters that are being raised are what they call a triploid oyster.
okay? So triploid, meaning three, meaning a three-chromosome oyster. The, the wild oyster we call diploids, okay, which is a two-chromosome oyster. The, in order for anything in nature to reproduce, you need an equal number of chromosomes. So since the triploid oysters are a three-chromosome oyster, they grow, they filter the water, just like a, a wild diploid oyster does, except the only downside is they don't reproduce. So it's a, a, a put and take uh, oyster. You're only, gonna, you're only gonna get back what you put down. The wild oyster, uh, which all of these are, are, are diploid oysters, okay? The wild oyster will reproduce. They will spawn. Now, the, there's, there's some different sizes here. When a oyster spawns, uh, and actually they can start spawning after about a year and a half old. The oysters are, it, it, it's kind of interesting about an oyster, it's just, we kind of call them gender benders, and an oyster can change its sex. So most of the oysters, the larger, older oysters, have a tendency to be mostly females, where the male oysters have a tendency to be mostly the, uh, the, the, the smaller oysters, the females are mostly your larger oysters. Uh, a wild oyster will grow about an inch a year. To legally harvest a wild oyster, they have to be three inches long. So normally it takes about three years from an oyster to grow from spat to a small oyster to a legal size oyster. Uh, there's a couple of pictures here and a uh, couple of oysters and you can see that, that some of them are different sizes. Uh, this oyster here is, I don't know, um, I'll show you another tool of the trade. This is a culling hammer, okay? And what a culling hammer is designed for is as these oysters get older is to knock them off and separate them individually. Or if you have undersized oysters on the shell with a legal size oyster is to put the undersized oysters back and to retain the legal size oyster. But this is three inches between here. So if you see the size of the oyster, you can see that that oyster is well over three inches in size, which is a legal harvestable size oyster. These oysters here are probably two years old, although this one is just, just shy. So it's probably two, two and a half years old, this oyster is. Uh, some of these oysters here may be a year old. You can see where it's about an inch, inch and a half in size. Uh, when an oyster spawns, it puts larvae into the water. And that larvae goes into the, the water column, and your currents move that larvae up and down the current, up and down the, the waterways, whether it's the bays or the rivers and whatnot. And the, the larvae has a tendency to come towards the surface when an oyster first spawns. As it gets older, it gradually settles out to the bottom. And the, the longer that, that larvae is, after about 10 days, it's pretty much all settles down. And that's, that's the importance of having a good, clean bed. An oyster needs something kind of clean and a hard surface to stick to for the oyster to grow. You can see where you've got, uh, let's count, one, two, three, four, five, six. There's six oysters growing on this shell that larvae stuck to, and then the oysters started growing out. The, uh, if, if an oyster doesn't, I'll show you some examples here how big oysters can get, okay? This one is a, probably a four inch oyster, but, but look at this oyster compared to this oyster. Now there's not many oysters that, that really get that big. These came off the bottom here, but, uh, but they will, they, they will actually get uh, you know, pretty large. Uh, an oyster can live up to like 20 years. Most of them don't. Probably average is probably five to seven or eight years old uh, what, what oysters live, but they, they, they can live longer extended lives. Let's see, what else? Uh, Oysters, as far as uh, and, and and most of you, uh, you know, if 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 
you've been to school or, or, or you're school age or you're still in school or, or you have attended educational stuff, they talk about oysters filtering the water. And a mature oyster can actually, everybody says 50 gallons, realistically it's more like 30 gallons, but a grown oyster can filter about 30 gallons of water a day, which is really, really important uh, because oysters do uh, clean our waterways, but keep in mind they can't do it all them, by themselves. It's up to us, each individual, to help clean the bay, to protect and make sure that we have oysters in the water but it's also up to us to, to control runoff, development, pollution, and other things that impact our, our waterways as well. The important thing about the oysters filtering the water and cleaning the water is that the cleaner the water is, then sunlight can penetrate the shorelines and the SAVs, the submerged aquatic vegetation, can grow, it needs sunlight to, for the grasses to, to grow. And the grasses pro provide habitat for, for baby fish and crabs and, and, and the rest of the entire ecosystem in the bay. So everything does its part in, in helping our, our entire ecosystem produce and survive. Okay, uh, while we're on the subject of oysters, we're gonna talk a little bit about tools of the trade. Now, I don't, if you can see these, these are called shaft tongs. These are 14s. Guys normally work them up to, uh, depending on how deep of water you're in, up until 22 feet. Uh, the nickname for these shaft tongs were called widow sticks because uh, normally what you're doing when you're working the shaft tongs, you're standing on the edge of your washboards on the boat and in the winter time they get icy and you know everybody didn't always make it home and uh, so so that's mostly the women nickname these uh, widow sticks uh, as far as the the, the shaft tongs but it's your traditional way and I'll, I'll show you a demonstration here in a couple minutes but it's your traditional way to to harvest oysters there are other ways to harvest oysters. There's a uh, uh, power dredge that can be drug behind a boat with hydraulics to lift it out of water. There's patent tong rigs that uses hydraulics that drops like this clamshell type teeth straight down that, that harvest oysters as well. But this is the traditional way to harvest oysters. The interesting thing about shaft tongs harvesting oysters versus power dredge Shaft tongs here, probably on an oyster bar, are only probably about 60% efficient, maybe. So probably of the oysters you're, you're gonna take off of a bar with shaft tongs, you're probably gonna get at best maybe 60 to 70%, maybe at best, out of it. Whereas with a power dredge, okay, you could probably harvest 90% of the bar. Uh, you know, with uh, just uh, the differences in the uh, techniques and the equipment. Uh, this, I will show you, uh, these are called nippers. And you can see that they're much smaller and much, much easier to handle. And actually a waterman, uh, you know, it, it wasn't till, till, till modern times here where you had uh, 401ks and IRAs and, and whatnot in retirement. So most of the time, if you work the water, you work the water till you couldn't work anymore. And uh, you'll see these shaft tongs here can get a bit taxing on the body. So the nippers in the wintertime, all the, your, your allergy dies off and you can see the bottom in four or five feet of water. And you can take a pair of these nippers and go around in shallower water and actually see the oysters you're catching and reach down and pick up individual oysters and you're probably not going to harvest as many oysters as you, as you would with with shaft tongs or other means but you could still catch four five eight ten bushel a day and it was uh, uh much friendlier on the body as as you got a little older all right we'll move up and, and i'll show you a quick demonstration on how these tongs work 
Okay, uh, now this is for demonstration purposes only since we're not going for a, uh, a, a boat ride out, out on the oyster bar here. There's, a, there's some shell and just uh, some scattered oysters that I've seen along the dock here. So just to give you a demonstration on how these shaft tongs work is normally you're standing on the edge of the washboards of the boat and you drop them down to the bottom and then you work them like scissors. And there will be shell mixed in, there will be oysters mixed in. Uh, you can see here where you have some oysters, but you also have uh, some shell mixed in, some young oysters, oysters of all different ages here. But you also have some shell too. Now you can see where these oysters get some slime and silt on them and that's the important thing is you don't want too much silt on the oysters because when they spawn and reproduce you want a, the, the cleaner the surface the better for that larvae to stick to. But uh, you can see that uh, uh, you know it's probably in the in the 90s late 80s 90s uh, the two diseases dermo and MSX kind of devastated the oyster population in the Chesapeake Bay, but there are improvements and it's very encouraging to see. Uh, I would have never, 20 years ago, I would have never ever taken a chance to plant oysters on the bottom because you're just throwing your money overboard. It, it would be certainly a waste of time to do so. But it's encouraging enough now to see more people getting into aquaculture, more oysters getting overboard, and uh, people like you guys, awareness, okay, of our waterways, of our estuaries, and protecting and being concerned over it. I think uh, certainly, you know, half the battle is awareness, and more and more people are aware today. So I think we're making strides in the right direction, but we've got a really long way to go to get where we need to be. Okay, guys, and in closing, that pretty much wraps up uh, what we've done here today. Uh, really miss seeing you guys in person. Hopefully, uh, hopefully I'll, I'll see you next year, and uh, we can actually get out on the water and take a boat ride. So uh, until uh, you're, you're welcome to, to come and visit me anytime. Uh, my name's Captain Phil Langley, Fish to Bay Charters. So uh, if, if you ever want to put a small group together and do a heritage tour of your own, you're, you're welcome to it. But uh, nothing else, hopefully uh, I'll see you next year at the wharf and really miss seeing you guys in person. Everybody stay safe. Take care.